Heavenly Father, once again, we ask for your presence as we take this study back up. I ask that you'd help me get uh, beyond this material that we can keep moving forward in our consideration of Daniel's last vision. Uh, give us light, we ask. Uh, bless us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Previous presentation, I referred to this quote here from Testimonies, Volume 1, and I did so in the context as I knew from the four generations that that final generation would be bowing down to the sun. If you go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 8, where we get the image of jealousy, um, the weeping for Tammuz, and the bowing down to the sun, you'll notice that in verse 18, no, verse 16, the, the fourth abomination is when they're bowing down to the sun, and that's 816. It says, And he brought me into the inner court of the ha Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. This is the, the fourth abomination up here. Um, Lines up with the fourth church, Thyatira. Um, and li and there's a, other, several other four, fours from the scriptures we could bring to this, but we're, we're not. And what we're doing is we're plugging this into the history of 9-11 until July 18th. And July 18th um, is, one way to express it would be 7-18. And 7 plus 18 equals 25. And you've got 25 men bowing down to the sun in verse 16 of Ezekiel 8. And this is where the Levites come. And how old do you have to be to be a Levite? 25. Okay, so July 18th is speaking to this 25 here. How old do you have to be to be a priest? 30. Okay, so... And when were the priests 30 years old? November 9. Uh, November 9, they're 30 years old. And in November 9, if you understand the midnight chiasm of November 9th, it's the history of September 7th, 63 days later, takes you to November 9th, and 63 days later takes you to January 11th. That midnight chiasm at one level is one way mark, Okay, that's where the priests are 30 years old. But on the beginning of that chiasm on September 7th, what happens in terms of Gideon? Gideon had goes through two, two cleansings. Okay, the first it's 32,000 come to 9-11. Okay, and 22,000 turn back at 9-11 in the story of Gideon. 22 being what? 220, okay, Restor restoration. What is he restoring here? Just so, for future reference, he's putting in place the throne of David. He's passing by the former covenant people and he's getting ready to place the throne of David right here at the midnight cry. And at 9-11, the horn of David begins to bud out, okay, 22. He's restoring uh, his ensign to the world, so to speak, and at least 10,000, okay, 10 being a testing process. This 10,000 is going to go to right here, and right here on 9-7, if you're looking at this as the chiastic structure, the movement goes down from 10,000 to 300 in the story of Gideon, leaving what? 9,700. The 9,700 is 9-7. It's also 977 B.C., with Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13. So in so here you would have 300. Right? And 30. And what did you say? 300 could be a 30, he said. Yeah, yeah you, you're going to see several here references to 30. But let's move on. This is the... I understood that when people got here at this first Sunday law that marks the image of the beast testing time, 
they would accept the Sunday law because they would not have the spiritual strength to do otherwise. But I never understood until this started opening up that they actually get changed into Catholics where they're, they're going to willingly accept the Sunday law. It's not good because they're struggling with it. Their mind gets totally Catholicized, if that's a, a right word, before you get there. So here's a, a dream of Sister White that speaks to this, and I mentioned it the other day. Okay. I'm on page 8 of the notes. She's been talking about the, the troubles. I'm cutting into a story. She's been talking about the troubles her and James are having with the brethren at Battle Creek, the leadership of the church. And she says, But to my grief, great grief, I found that the condition of my brain made it impossible for me to write. She was so overburdened she couldn't write out the testimonies. The idea of writing testimonies, either general or personal, was given up, and I was in, a, in continual distress because I could not write them. In this state of things, it was decided that we would return to Battle Creek and there remain while the roads were in a muddy, broken up condition and that I would there complete number 12, a testimony. My husband was very anxious to see his brethren at Battle Creek and to speak to them and rejoice with them in the work which God was doing for him. I gathered up my writings and we started on our journey. On the way, we held two meetings in Orange and had evidence that the church was profited and encouraged. We were ourselves refreshed by the Spirit of the Lord. That night, I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek. Looking out from the side glass at the door, I saw a company marching up to the house, two and two. <clears throat> they looked stern and determined. I knew them well. And turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented, presented an, the appearance of a Catholic procession and bore in his, one bore in his hand a cross, another a reed. And as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house saying three times, this house is prescribed, the goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. They've spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me. What seized her? Terrorism seized her. Terror seized her. And I ran through the house out of the north door. So, what is she representing there? Okay, you're... you're You're almost there, but not quite. Terror tidings out of the east seized her. And I ran through the house out of the north door, tidings out of the north, and found myself in the midst of a company, some whom I knew, but I dared not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I tried to seek a retired spot where I might weep and pray without meeting eager, inquisitive eyes wherever I turned. I repeated, repeated frequently, if I could only understand this, if they will tell me what I said or what I've done. I wept and pray, prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. I tried to read sympathy or pity for me in the looks of those around me and mark the countenances of several whom I thought would speak to me and comfort me if they did not fear that they would be observed by others. I made one attempt to escape from the crowd, but seeing that I was watched, I concealed my intentions. I commenced weeping aloud, saying, If they would only tell me what I've done or what I've said. My husband, who was sleeping in a bed in the same room, heard me weeping aloud and awoke me. My pillow was wet with tears, and a sad depression of spirits was upon me. So, the faithful in the time period when the Omega apostasy is being turned into Catholicism are going to have a very discouraging experience going on. Where do we see that discouraging experience illustrated? In the very next chapter of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 9, those that are sighing and crying for the abominations are the ones that receive the seal. And when does it end? When she's woke, it's a dream. When does she wake up? At the midnight cry. So from the time period that this new movement, 
this new holy order, this holy order, uh, becomes, be, begins to be Catholic until the midnight cry. It's not good times. It's rough times. If you're on the right side of the issue, you're going to be weeping and sighing and crying. What, what she described just then was exactly what went on. I, I get that. Okay. Our holy order. Okay. Please notice I had that bold face up there. Um, they have spoken against our holy order. Have I spoken against the Omega movement? Against poor men? No, no, no. Have I spoken yes or no? Against yeah. the Omega movement? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, we've spoken against their holy order. I'm, I'm applying this to their holy order because they're the ones that have obviously flipped to Catholicism. Praising the Jesuits, uh, leaning upon the doctrine of infallibility. Um, so, this is, this is the, the classic statement of the Omega apostasy. Now, I'm, I'm laying the Omega apostasy on the top of Korah, Dathan, and Byram into this history of four generations. This is the, the most common re reference to the Alpha Omega in the writings of Sister White. It says, The enemy of souls is sought to bring in a supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand for the pillars of our faith and engage in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principle of truth that God has given in His wisdom to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed, the fundamental principles. And then she goes down, and the one sentence I have highlighted in that paragraph, books of a new order would be written. A, a books of a new order. A holy order. Okay, they've spoken against our holy order. So, I'm going to pass over that. And I've broke that paragraph down. And there are 13 things that the Omega movement does. What's 13 a symbol of? Rebellion. Rebellion. Okay, 13 things in this paragraph that are marked. And I have them listed out rather than read the paragraph. These are Cut and pasted from the paragraph. A great reformation was to take place. Have, have they done that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have they engaged in the process of reorganization? Oh, yes. The reformation would give up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Mm -hmm. Did that. The fundamental principles, that's the foundational, the foundational one, Daniel 11, the threefold union, the fundamental principles of truth would be accounted as error and discarded. They wouldn't just be discarded, they were going to be teach that they were erroneous. Okay, did they do that? Yeah. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded and also God who created it. What, what was it that Parminder said? Um, about yeah, the sa uh, uh, <laughs> worst thing that could have happened to us was, 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 I mean, to the church was to accept the Sabbath. The worst thing that they they teach that the worst thing that could happen to the Adventist Church was to accept the Sabbath in 1844. Uh, the the Sabbath would be, of course, be lightly regarded. Our religion would be changed. How was it changed? Into a political into a political movement. A new organization would be established. If you have a new organization, what is demanded? There has to be an old, old organization. So there's two organizations being discussed here. A new one and an old one. And the new one's the one you don't want to be in. Uh, a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Oh, so yeah. so the leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. But God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which, without God, is worthless. Oh yeah, it's good to do good, but you can't do, do a thus saith the Lord, so you're not going to have any divine power to help you do good. Now the founders, who's the founders? The main people. The cross and the reed. The one carrying the cross and the one carrying the reed. You can draw lines like nobody else Okay, the... The one that has the, the reed that measures, that draws the lines, and the one that has the cross. Those two leaders, the founders of this system, would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. Wonderful does not necessarily mean positive. Right. The whole world wonders after the papacy in Revelation 13. 
Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. This is a new movement. It demands that there is an old movement. Just like a new organization, old organization. Ha they both have to be there. Or it would say nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of this movement. But this is a new movement. Their foundation would be built upon sand. What's sand? Sand is the numbers. They get the majority. And storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. What's the storm and tempest that sweeps it all away? July 18th. But, number 13, and I put this down here, books of a new order would be written. What is the new order? It's the holy order that she saw. That were people that she knew. She turned away. She looked back. Knew them well. Knew them well. She looked back and they changed into Catholics. We discussed so many times. We knew some of these people so well. We couldn't understand why they never came to us. Great Controversy 235. Speaking of a holy order. Or an order. Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. The order, the order, uh, that's what they teach. We don't believe that. The Jesuits are an order, okay? Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscious holy silence, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. Great Controversy 464, notwithstanding the widespread declination of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. Before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of God such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured upon his children. At that time, many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has been supplanted it has supplanted love for God and His Word. Okay, there's people separating there that have been in places where the love of the world was the, the, the theme. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And before the time for such a movement shall be made... He will endeavor, shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is being poured out, that there, there will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Now, this is a, a dynamic that it takes place in the Christian world at large, but I'm reading it into this movement because God's dealing with men are never the same, and Satan doesn't do anything different than he always does. I never noticed it before, but there's, there's a striking relationship, a uh, striking similarity between that statement that you just read and the one there about the, the New Reformation. Books of a New Order? Yeah, all that, that whole passage there about the enemy of souls, and, and both of them start with, well... The enemy of souls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. When you put those two together, it really accentuates it, I guess you would say. Yeah, there's the, okay, next page, page 10. I hope that most of you are familiar with what took place in the German... The first international camp meeting of PNT's new organization in Germany in 2019. Okay, at that meeting, uh, popery was exercised <coughs> against the message of July 18th. Stephen and Odilio had been there and wanted to uh, discuss it, have a fair reading, and they were they were chastised greatly. 
on the same day that the women were required to put on pants. Okay, same day. And that day was August 29th. But on August 29th, 1799, uh, the Pope that had been taken captive in 1798 died in exile. So from August 29th, 1799, when he died, until August 29th, 2019, it's 220 years. The Pope dies in 1799, and popery comes into this movement exactly to the very day, 220 years later. It awakens from the dead and is restored in Germany. So it can be a good restoration or an evil restoration. Yeah, it could, it could be restoration bad, restoration good. It's just a symbol of restoration. Okay, now we dealt with, what I'm dealing with is that in this history from right here, from, it may be a little bit before, but we can mark 2018 because now you have both uh, one with the cross and one with the reed working together publicly. Okay, this is, Tess is here publicly teaching her foolish predictions about November 9th. And we're told that it will be through false doctrine. They're going to, they're going to do false teachings to do this work. This is the false latter rain. Weeping from um, Tammuz, the third generation, is the false latter rain. It's in this generation, 1919, that the Adventist church reaches out to get accreditation from the the theological universities of apostate Protestantism. Uh, this is the compromise of Constantine. This is the internal desolation that's going on. This is the, the story of the General Conference President Paulson. It's other lines too, but here is this, these Catholic, primarily the, the, what's introduced right here is the Catholic doctrine of dispensationalism, which is nothing close to what we taught about biblical dispensations. It was a doctrine invented by Rome. You can Google it and teach it. And what they're doing is they're developing a false Lateran message. That's what Weeping for Tammuz represented. So they're bringing this back and it's in this history, the third and fourth generation. God's jealousy, His judgment because of His jealousy is exercised against those that hate Him unto the Third and fourth generation. So this is, this is where God is going to begin to respond to all this foolishness. And what I'm saying is in this history here is where we see Catholicism begin to manifest. Okay, it, you, Where you can see it out in the open. Um, we understand back here, Tess's mother, I, I never understood this till this history, is raised Roman Catholic. Okay, And she's the hidden mother of it all. So in this history here, we're seeing Catholicism, and in August 29th, right down in here, just before the midnight chiasm starts, you have 220 years where popery is awakened. But from here on, you really get an emphasis on what they call the Omega, okay? Their dispensationalism. And their dispensationalism about the Omega, it's emphasizing that the beginning of Adventism was the Alpha. It had problems. Ellen White and the Pioneers had problems. It had errors. But this last Omega 144,000 movement will be perfect. But also, the beginning of this movement, back here in 1989, up to here, uh, Elder Jeff and the message there, it had problems. It had errors. But as of 2014, by Tess's definition, she's now the leader of this Omega movement, and there is no errors, okay? It's perfect. Uh, it's infallible. So in this history, we have the doctrine of infallibility, a Catholic doctrine being introduced, and we dealt with this recently. When it comes to the Catholic doctrine of infallibility, it was put in place by the Catholic Church on July 18th, 1870. So you got two witnesses there. To what? 187. 187 is July 18th, and this is July 18th. In this history, we wake up to the fact that their prediction on November 9th is the offering of the, of the prophet of Baal and the priest of the grove, of the prophet and the priest that have the reed and the cross. Okay? 
they've made predictions about November 9th that aren't going to happen. Our prediction is July 18th, and it's going to happen, and this is the story of Carmel and Elijah. And the proof that Elijah's message was right was that fire comes down out of heaven on July 18th to confirm it. Okay, so... Yeah, there's going to be a lot of water poured around the offering in advance. Okay, the water's getting poured along the offering. The stones, the 12 stones are getting reorganized. He first takes the 12 stones and, and, and puts them in place, then dumps water on them. So we see that this is a distinction between the false prophet and the true prophet, as illustrated in the story of Elijah at Carmel. But over here... 1870 from 2020, is what? 1800 months. 150 years. Okay, and it's also how many months? 1800 months. It's 1800 months, but what I'm going to focus on now is 150 years. This doctrine of infallibility that came into Catholicism in 1870 at Vatican I, it was a, a meeting over several years called Vatican I. Vatican II was a meeting over several years in the early 1960s. In Vatican II, the Vatican drew up its plans on how to take back the Protestant churches under control of the, to be under control of the Catholic Church. But what come out of Vatican I, it, on July 18th, 1870, was this doctrine that uh, when the Pope is speaking as the leader of the Catholic Church, he's infallible. In this history here, from 9-11 up to here, this 150 years comes in, right here. This is the end of this period of time, because the doctrine of infallibility now is coming into this movement. You following me? Now, what I'm saying is, I don't, I don't have to force that, because I already have 150 years of the first woe, and I have 150 days in the story of Elizabeth, okay? And what I want you to see here is over here at midnight, what do we have off of that board? Well, at midnight, which is November 9th, 2019, but there's a chiasm, but I'm just taking it as a single way mark. We have 30 years of this movement. We now have Gideon's 300. And how old do you have to be? Well, I guess you could say that that's redundant, this 30 years. You have to be 30 years old to be a priest, but I'm going to put it up there. This history here is about the number three. So if you're looking from 9-11 to here, you can see 153. Okay? You with me? Because we dropped the zeros. And although we haven't dealt with it a great deal, you should remember that this here, the midnight cry, <coughs> based upon Ezra 7, 9, is the first day of the fifth month. Where does Ezra get on the first day of the fifth month? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And this is where the Lord chooses Jerusalem. This is about Jerusalem. This is the Jerusalem line. Okay, so David reigned in Hebron for seven or seven and a half years, depending on how you look at it. How many years did he reign in Jerusalem? 33. 33. So, if you want to look at this history here, although you haven't wrapped your mind around 153 yet, you'll see 153, but if you want to look at this history here, you have 1533. What's 1533? It's a manifestation of the power of God. Or 1530 would be even easier, because there's one month left, that's 30 days, so it would be 1533, right? There's just one month there. That's the six months. It's 30 days. Yeah, that's the other one. The, thir the, the one month. There's a 30 month. on the other side. 
no, no, from here, this story, you couldn't do that because this is the story of the birth of John. You've got seventh, oh, eighth, oh, John's going to be yeah. born right here. I see, I see, okay, yep. Okay, so, but yeah, that, that was the other 30. I knew there was one up there and it was, it was evading my mind. Now I want to show you some things before we move on. But look at your notes. Um, I've plugged back in Stephen's graph here. Remember that the time left over for one day, a day, a, a day in, in the 359 and the one day of atonement from, from Christ beginning his work in 31 AD until 1844, a day breaks down to 18, a day equals 1844 days and 21 hours. What's 21? 21 is midnight, is it not? and 15 minutes and 33 seconds. 15, 33, okay? I'm gonna just take that off because I'm dealing with 15, 33 and no one here has really looked at 153 yet. Now, this here, 9-11, it, would it be acceptable to say that 9-11 can be typified by August 11th, 1840? And we're identifying this as the first Sunday law. The midnight cry here is the first Sunday law. So that would be October 22nd, 1844. Yes, you follow me? Yeah. It's 1,533 days between them. Of course, you can also extend it out here. So the, this 1,533 manifestation of the power of God takes place from here to here, from here to here, depending on the the application you're doing. Uh, Moses at Horeb, when the law is being given, and, and I walked you through briefly in the last presentation, old, old truth. The giving of the law is the two tables. At the end of the world, the two tables are going to be presented to all mankind. That's an end sign. Um, the two tables were commemorated by the two wave loaves that were lifted up as a wave offering. And those two witnesses, the two tables of the Ten Commandments and the, the wave offering typified these two tables that were an ensign. And we know that this, this was the, the point of reference for the Protestants that they were to look at. Aren't they also, though, the, the, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy? Those yeah, they can, they, they can be two witnesses. They can be a lot of things. Um, but what I'm saying is the giving of the law is the giving of an ensign. Okay, right here, an ensign is given. Right here, an ensign is given. Okay, um, 1533 military time is 3.333. And then we work through the blessing of Daniel 12.12, 12, when his hand was removed. 12.5.12 12 is 144 in Daniel 12.12. 12. Blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days. 13.35, 1 times 3, times 3, times 5, equals 45. This is the history of the 45th President of the United States. But 1533, same numbers, quite the same thing, 45. 1 times 5 times 3 times 3 is 45. December 17th, 2016, where raphia and paneum is opened up when the Lord removes His hand as He removed His hand from the fullness of the year. Um, can be expressed, December 17th, 2016, can be expressed as 12, 17, 16. And 12 plus 17 plus 16 is 45. You following that in your notes? Yep. Okay, so from the taking of the Pope captive, uh, th these are just interesting things. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to deal with these because I don't want to get myself overwhelmed with these numbers, but read these these last two statements on your own time about the 1533s and the connection of when the Pope was taken captive. They're, they're self-explanatory. So, I'm at this point, I want to I try to plug some of the thoughts from earlier into here. F from 9-11, we have 150 that takes us to midnight. Do you understand that? Okay, and the 150 
is it, one of the places the 150 is taken from is the, the first woe, the fifth trumpet. And the first woe and the fifth trumpet comes to here, to November 9th. And here, the sixth trumpet and the second woe trumpet begins. Okay, This here is a 150 year prediction of the first woe. And this is a 391 year prediction of the second woe. Okay, they come together right here at midnight. Yes? So one of the things that can be derived is that on November 9th, this line of truth is going to become present truth. And what is the characteristic that we're seeing that is being marked in here from the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet? The element of time. It's the time element that comes to here, 150 years. And it's the time element of 391 that starts there. Okay, so what I'm saying is, at this point in time, prophetic time is being marked. Are you, does that seem like a stretch? Okay, this is a class. Does that seem like a stretch? No, because right after that, right after November 9th, when there, was, when there were studies going on in here, that's when you were really uh, started talking about Nashville. It was in this classroom right yeah. afterwards, and that was when the time was real, when you started doing it on, on this live stream and such. Was yeah, that, that's when we got challenged on time, because the time element had been based upon all these false predictions of tests. So now, the idea of touching time after November 9th, it's kind of risky, because the person that has been the voice of the time prediction all of her predictions, virtually all of them, collapsed before the, everyone's eyes. So if you're going to maintain a confidence in the element of time, it, was a, it, it becomes an issue here. All right? it, it takes a little bit of uh, confidence in the Lord's leading to actually hold on to this subject. In this, in this history, this chiasm of September 7th to January 11th, and I'm going to put right there, that's August 29th. What Odilio and Stephen are getting rebuked by in Germany from the, the new popes is the prediction of July 18th. Okay, The, the issue of, of the true time position is being agitated here. But they're also, they're also here. here. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just trying time. to say that the time element at this way mark becomes agitated. It becomes a characteristic. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I'm marking it. I'm not sure of all the implications. But all in respect, every prophecy has an element of time related to it, so... Okay. No way. Yeah, way. No that way. prophecy is a time. Pardon me? Prophecy is time. Prophecy is history. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah okay. All right. So you're going to tell me that every prophecy in the Bible has a time element with it, like the 391 and a half and 150, and I'm saying no way. They have specific times related to all the No, it, 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 should, we, should we render under Caesar the things that are Caesar? I won't answer that question. Just go cast your, your, your hook into the water and catch a fish and pull that fish out and there's going to be a coin in its mouth. It, 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 that's a prophecy that came to pass. Where's the element of time? Money. <laughs> okay, that's a stretch. Let's, let me give you a second witness here. Let me give you a second witness here. Because I'm, I'm purposely doing this and I have more than one witness. The story of Elizabeth. Her husband's working in the sanctuary. And at 9-11, an angel comes down out of heaven and gives him a message. And he rejects it. What is the message? It's <laughs> the message is a message of time. And he says, this can't be so. 
Why can't it be so? She's too old. Who is she? She's a woman. She's the church. She's the, a church at 9-11, right? And she don't have anything to do with time anymore. Why? What happens to the, to the ladies when they get into their 50s or so? Menopause. Menopause. She can't have babies no more. This church has, re, has passed the period of time of menopause. And her husband knows it. So when the husband is given a prediction saying, over here at the Sunday Law, your wife is going to have a baby, he rejects that message. What is he rejecting? What is it that prevents him from receiving that message? Is he no longer accepts time prophecy. You see it? Okay, but is she going to have a baby? Should he, should he, did he have the right to do that? No. Why? Because he's a son of Abraham. And two things about Abraham. Abraham had to know the voice of the Lord well enough that he could respond to God's voice even if it was telling him something that had contradicted something of the past. And Abraham had a wife that was beyond menopause, incapable of having a baby, and did she have a baby? Okay, so Abraham, the very beginning of the covenant story, and the covenant begins with the 144,000 right here. Zechariah should have accepted that angel's message, but he says, no way, she's beyond time. The church does not accept time application any longer. And what happens is, she gets pregnant, and she goes into hiding. For how long? Till right here. He becomes dumb. Till over here where he's going to speak. But she goes into hiding for five months. Yes? What is she hiding? Pregnancy. She's hiding time. She's hiding time. Now, if, if you don't think she's hiding time, tell me what Elizabeth means. Elizabeth, L, means God. Zabeth is the Hebrew word that's translated as seven times in Leviticus 26. She's the church of the God of the 2520. And she's in hiding in this time. And right here, she's going to come out of hiding, and she comes out of hiding as the church of the God of the 2520. Is that time? Amen. That's time. What, why does she do so? Because she got so big she couldn't hide it anymore. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> maybe she could have come out earlier. She has, she's governed, okay? She's she's. I won't say it, but anyway, so now you come into this month, and I'm contending that Mary gets over here in the sixth month, and they both prophesy. And I'm expecting you to read Luke chapter 1 and test what I'm saying, and check those words about Elizabeth, Zechariah. Zechariah is dumb here. What does Zechariah mean over here when he finally speaks? Zechariah speaks. What's Zechariah mean? God remembers. This is the Sunday issue. What's the Sunday issue in contrast with? Remember the Sabbath day. Okay, God remembers right here that one of the lines of the kings of Israel, King Zechariah, gets lined up here. Two witnesses to this double remembering. Also, at the Sunday law, God remembers the papacy. God remembers, yes, there's a remembering of the papacy. Double under her double as she is... But how many speakings do we have? We have Zechariah speaking. We have the Ass speaking. We have the United States speaking. We have Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk 2 speaking. Though the vision tarry, wait for it, for at the appointed time it shall surely speak. Okay, so this is, a, this is an application of prophecy that's just flat, easy, and airtight. 
that when you get to here, the subject of time comes back. It's been hidden, but now it is a testing issue. And the test is this prediction, November 9th, or this prediction, July 18th. So, um, all right, page, page 11. The midnight chiasm you have there on page 11, we have put up there. The, I call it the midnight chiasm. Oh, I, I, I've almost passed over 153. You wouldn't want me to do that after I brought it up. Prophesy again. In your notes on the page 11 under 153, prophesy again, you'll find that this 153 is probably a characteristic of presenting a message. And so I'm, we're using Revelation 10:11 to make this point. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10:11. Then John 21, 11 through 17. Go to John 21, 11 through 17. And what I'm wanting you to consider is that this 150 uh, can be 15, and these 30s and 300s can be 3. And if 153 is a symbol of prophesying again, it means that when we get here, we're going to have to prophesy July 18th, even though we've been involved with prophesying November 9th. And November 9th is a valid way mark. But it was not the message that we were supposed to prophesy. Our message is July 18th. Okay, we've been involved with this, but this was weighted down with Catholic garbage. Mm -hmm. So now here, 153, I'm saying, represents prophesy again. Alright? So in verse 11 of John 21, it says... Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153, and for all there were so many, yet was not that net broken. Jesus said unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen, after that, he was risen from the dead. Okay, so you got a number three mark there with that 153, but you can have another three marked with it. Okay. Um, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou more than these? What does Simon mean? Hearing. What does Peter mean? Rock. What does Jonah mean? Dove. Simon Peter is the one that heard the message of 9-11. He heard the message of Christ's baptism when the dove came down. The Holy Spirit like a dove came down. When they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, So who is he speaking to? Simon. To Simon Peter. He's speaking to Simon Peter. So who is he speaking to? You, you've forgotten? He's speaking to the 144,000. When does the sealing of the 144,000 begin? When Zechariah is struck dumb. Okay, so that's who he's speaking to in this passage. So when they had dined, Jesus said, 
to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. So it's the third time. There's 153 fish. It's the third time that Jesus comes to them after his resurrection and he's telling Simon Peter three times, you must prophesy again. Right here, we must prophesy again. What are we going to prophesy again? Right there. How is he saying, how is he telling him to prophesy again? Feed my sheep. How many times did he tell him that? Three times. Okay, what in... I mean, this has, got, this has got to be the simplest one there is, probably. When you find three in the Scriptures, 99 out of 100 times, what is the symbol of? The three angels' messages. So, when he's saying, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, what's he supposed to feed them? The Word, the three angels' messages. Prophesy again. Was Peter and the disciples prophesying? No. They were out fishing. Yeah. All night long they were fishing. Okay, they, they, what were they doing? They were staying in their tents reading their Bibles. They were studying, if you want to say that. But they weren't out prophesying. Here it's saying, prophesy again. Yes? You see it? Amen. Um, so... Snow's letters, they, the handout I gave you, the correction for yesterday, all right, and it's online for those of you that are watching online. The, the correction that Theodore sent in, there are three graphs here on it. And the top one is the second Italian meeting, and in the, one in, the one in the middle is Samuel Snow's letters, and um, so is the, the third one. It's a different approach to Samuel Snow's letters, but these two are the line of Samuel Snow. And I said the other day when we started on this straight line that even though we're walking up through these footsteps that you have to bring, to really get impacted by them, you have to bring the Josiah prophecy from Ezekiel on these lines, and you have to bring the history of Samuel Snow onto these lines, and the history of Josiah Litch's Revelation 9 application onto these lines. Those three witnesses onto the history of this movement are what really hold it together. And I said the fourth witness was the chiasms. And I said that in Ezekiel's line, in Revelation 9's line, and in Samuel Snow's line, there are chiastic structures that are also repeated in our history. But I says, well, I'm not going to go there because I didn't want to complicate it. But in this handout, you can see some of these chiastic structures. But what I want you to take note of here is that Samuel Snow's line begins on February 16th, 1844, and it ends on July 18th. You see that? Okay, so leave it at that and go back to your notes. Snow's letters from February 16th to July 18th are 153 days. And what was Snow's work? Midnight cry, develop midnight cry, but keep going. What was his work? It was 153 total days. So it was a glorious man. Oh, glorious man, perhaps. Yes, it was. But what was it? We're not quite there yet. He was prophesying again, wasn't he? So was the Did, the, yeah, the Millerites had predicted 1843. The Lord removed his hand when 1843 ends. Samuel Snow is used to get things straight so that they could prophesy again. Mm -hmm. And how many days are in Samuel Snow's history? 100 
and 53. 153 is prophesy again. You see it? But it's, it's 1533. And 1533 is 1335. When you get to the point to where you can see and grasp the 1533 and the 153, you're blessed. You're blessed. blessed is he who waiteth. When did you begin waiting? Right here. And cometh to here. And obviously the 45 relates to it based upon that calculation on the left. Yeah, it's, it just takes place in the history of the 45th president of the United States. Right, and it's right under it. On the chart. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, that was when we were done that. Oh, yeah. The two places that it's established on this chart are in connection with the 1335 and the 1290. Okay, now... I challenge you, although I guarantee you will not be... Do you have any explanation why, what would the 45 was supposed to represent? Yeah, 30, yeah it's right there. It's 30, easy. Minus 12, it's yes, Daniel I, I, 12. I it the, says from the time from the daily, the time... But they, they didn't this, know... They had an explanation, guys. It's on there. It's on the chart. From the time that the daily was taken away. When was the daily taken away? 508. It's taken away in 508. There'll be how many days, according to Daniel 12, this passage? 1290 days. Where does 1290 days take you to? 1798. Blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to the 1335. 1335, beginning here. Takes you to where? Takes you to the very end of 1843. Takes you, at uh, one way you can say April 18th, 1843, or 19th. Because the 19th of April was the first day of the first month of 1844. Coming to this way mark right here, where the 1335, where 1843 touches 1844, the word cometh means toucheth. It's where you get the blessing. That was the blessing. What was the blessing? What was the blessing? Where, where, where does that blessing impact us? Where is our blessing? When do we have, where do we see it touching? Where is our blessing? November 9th. November 9th. Good for you. It'll be right here. Okay, we may be looking at it over here, looking back at it, just getting it. But right here is where it's touching. What was the blessing? What was the blessing? You've got to wrap your mind around this one. What happened? on the first day of the first month in 1844 two classes of worshipers were separated they were on the day. yeah the protestants have rejected the message that was empowered when the divine symbol came down on august 11th 1840 there's a group that has rejected the message of the divine symbol coming down on 911 right here this is the blessing and it's the 45 and it's in the history of 45. What, what I'm saying is, did the Millerites have an explanation for the 45, or was that Wait, just... It's right here on the chart. Yes, but they didn't realize how significant it was going to be uh, now. No, no, they didn't. You're right, they did If that's what you're trying to say, did the Millerites understand this 45 impacting our history? No way. No, no way. But it's, it's, it's as profound today as it was back then. No, it's much more profound now. Okay. Why is it more profound now? Because we're the final um, because it fulfillment. Because so many different things that, that they didn't even they didn't know that it would be 45th president. Uh, all your logic may be correct, but uh, uh, there's a prophetic passage that we all know. Even angels desire to look upon uh, that. That could work too. Okay, w w what are these? What? Prophetic time periods, four to six, two tables, uh, wave They're jewels. Oh, they're jewels. Where were they? Miller put them in a casket 
and put him on a table. A table and told everyone to come and see. And in 1863, they got scattered. But the dirt brush man, he comes in, he grabs them, and he throws them back into a casket that's much larger. And, ten times and they shine ten times brighter at the end. And in the original brightness, they shone as the sun. Okay, so there's the point of reference. They didn't understand. They understood one-tenth of what's opened up to us at that application. Shall we pray? Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just have a comment. Uh, well, when you look at um, the upper room, um, there were like 120 people there. Yep. And this was after Judas was ruined. And they added Matthias, and Matthias means here. So, um, it's so interesting because it's like 120, which can also um, take you to the attack line. And um, that's at, at one level, it's midnight. And um, if you take like um, nine, if you take like 89 and you put it in reverse, it's like 98. So you can take like um, one, two, and you put it in reverse, it's like two, one. So it's like with midnight meets, it's with 120 in. And that was where um, Matthias was added, and Matthias means here. So, yeah. Everyone follow that? Yeah. Matthias means gift of God, and he's the one that they chose to replace Judas. Thank you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that you're opening. We thank you that you're helping us uh, gather together some aptitude to grapple with these numbers, these these time periods, this, this chronology. We see that we have been given a prediction to proclaim and that it is confirmed by prophecy that it has the element of time connected with it and that we have been hindered somewhat by the enemy of the Omega uh, cluttering uh, November 9th with a bunch of foolish ideas. But we thank you that through your prophetic word you're clarifying these things uh, that we might be about our business of giving this final message uh, that we might go home with you forever. And we ask a blessing upon our day's work, our day's study, and a blessing upon the work that uh, these presentations might do as they go out over the web. In Jesus' name, amen.